Hello and welcome to the webinar. Today we're talking about self-carriage and it's a really misunderstood term and it's a very important thing to consider when you're training your horse and you're riding your horse, even if you're just leading your horse, actually self-carriage is really, really important. Um, and so I want to talk about it today from all of those perspectives. But first I want to talk to you a little bit about um, why, why it's such a misunderstood term. And I think when we think about self-carriage, we often think about the dressage horse that's in this frame, this round frame and, you know, going along, maintaining that frame. And, and that's what we think about. And actually that isn't the case at all. And, you know, one lot of horses that's probably the least likely to be in self-carriage is today's sadly modern dressage horse because what's happening usually is they're in exactly the opposite of self-carriage because they're actually being held back in the front and pushed on from behind and the rider is doing you know all of that work and so it hasn't actually it's not actually in self-carriage at all. So what I want to talk to you uh, about the five things, the five things that go up to make, go in to make up self-carriage. I'm just going to say them quickly now and then we'll talk about them one by one. The first thing is rhythm. The second thing is tempo. The third is stride length. The next is your line. And the final thing is the horse's outline. Now you'll notice the way outline is the last thing. So first thing we think about when somebody says self-carriage, it's the last thing that comes up in the um, list of things that I'm going to discuss. And there's a reason for that. And, and I'll talk to you about that as we go along. So for me, self-carriage is probably the most important thing that we teach the horse. And I teach it right from the very start. So whether you're starting a horse under saddle or whether you're retraining a horse perhaps a horse that's already started and you're retraining it self-carriage is the first thing you go for after relaxation okay so we start with relaxation then the next thing is self-carriage because the opposite of self-carriage is that horse that's got to be made to you know you have to ride every stride and I remember you know in Singapore I remember um, just before one of the Rolex international competitions I went into and I had this Danish um, dressage instructor and I remember her shouting at me because they always shout at the Europeans um, shouting at me she said, ride every stride don't let him go pick him up pick him up I'm going oh my god it was such hard work I was so fit um you know, I've got this 16 two hand horse and I'm riding every stride. And what that meant, of course, was keeping this horse up here in front and wrapping my legs around the horse and lifting it up with my legs. And it's exactly the opposite of what you want, really. And if you look back, you know, 20, 30 years at dressage, it was nothing like that. It really was. It was true self-carriage. You know, these horses were carrying themselves around the dressage arena and so I want us you know for the next sort of 45 minutes or so anyway to think much less about that picture of self-carriage that always comes to our mind and think more about what the horse is actually doing okay so let's start with the first of those five points and the first one was rhythm now we get a little bit confused sometimes between rhythm and tempo so I'm going to make it really clear now the rhythm is the beat the tempo is the speed okay so the beat let's talk about the rhythm first of all now in self-carriage it means that your horse has to maintain all these things the rhythm the tempo the stride the line and the outline it has to maintain all those things so the rhythm first of all Let's talk about that. It's the beat of the gait. So in walk, walk is a four beat gait, all right? So if you ruin your horse's walk, and that's quite easy to do, you know. I remember being told once many years ago, again by another dressage person, they said I was buying a horse and this was a judge who was giving me some advice on that. And she said, buy the canter um, because she said, you know, the walk is the easiest thing to ruin. She said a lot of people that walk their dressage horses, especially on, you know, in frame and on a, 
you know, tight rein and practice a lot of collected walk often ruin the walk. And what happens to the walk is it becomes lateral. So you lose your four beat movement, becomes more of a two beat movement and the, the legs start to move together. Um, on each side of the horse and that's a really really bad sign but it's a very easy thing to ruin she said to me the trot you can always improve the trot you know the trot isn't static the trot that you have you can work on that you can if you want more elevation in the trot you can um, work your horse over trotting poles small cavalettis do some gymnastic jumping you can really work on that trot so don't worry too much about the trot that you purchase. So the canter you're stuck with. She said the canter, you really can't improve much with the canter. So, you know, buy the canter. So get a horse that has a good natural canter and that's what you're looking for. So that, I thought that was really interesting. So back to the walk. The walk's a four beat movement. If you can hear anything different, your horse is wrong so when you ride next time you're riding just close your eyes and imagine and listen and feel for those four beats and it's something that i used to do a lot when i rode was count and what that what the counting does is it it, it will come in um, more useful in the next thing when we start talking about tempo but it's good for getting you used to getting a feel for those beats of the pace so the next one is trot and it's a two beat movement because diagonal feet move together with the trot, you know, so the left front and the right hind move together. Um, now, again, this is, it doesn't matter whether you're riding um, a working trot or a Western jog, they're still trot movements or PF, they're all, it's three different trot movements and the you know, things are changing there. So the length of the stride is changing and the, um, the tempo is changing, but they still should be trot movements. And so when you are doing those um, different gates, it's important that you, when you're sitting on the horse, that you can count one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. If you're jogging, if you're doing PF, or if you're in a working trot, you should always be able to count that. And so I, I encourage you to do that. Next time you're on your horse, close your eyes. You don't have to close your eyes. Whenever I close my eyes, it's much easier to count and to feel when you close your eyes. Don't, if you think it's dangerous, don't do that. <laughs> don't when you ring me up saying, you told me to close my eyes when I was riding my horse. <laughs> so um, feel it and count it. You know, just a few circles, one, two, one, two, one, two. It's really useful and it will get you a good feel for that trot movement, that two beat trot movement. The canter, of course, is a three beat movement. Now, again, it doesn't matter whether you're doing a canter pirouette, a canter circle, or if you're loping, it still should be a three beat movement. Now, if you want to see a ruined canter, the best place to look is a Western pleasure horse, because quite often those horses are actually walking or trotting behind. It's a bit hard to tell, but they've lost their three beat movement. And it's incorrect. It doesn't matter what the judges say. It doesn't matter who wins, it's wrong. A lope and a canter are the same thing. There might be different speeds, but they're the same beat. They should always be a three beat movement so you have that means you have one foot on the ground at one time just just the one and then two go down and then the one so it's one two three one two three one two three so when you're riding that again probably you shouldn't close your eyes but count one two three one two three one two three and when if your horse slows down then you can count one two three four one two three four one two three four you know that you've got a four beat canter and it's really good to get to know that feeling okay if we go up to gallop of course we've got a four beat movement then and you know look if you're going that fast um intentionally count by all means if it's unintentional just stop um so there we go we've got a four beat walk a two beat trot a three beat canter those are the most commonly used paces um so it doesn't matter whether you're jogging loping trotting or cantering it's the same you, those are the paces of course if you've got a gated horse you know we are talking they've got a, a, a two beat tolt which is um lateral movement as well so that's a, that's another gate as well but 
the most common ones that we're going to talk about today are those. So the rhythm, the horse must maintain its own rhythm, which basically means the horse should stay in gait. So if you've asked the horse to trot, it, if the horse is in self-carriage, it should trot until you ask it to canter or walk or stop. So that's self-carriage. What it means is it means it's not you maintaining the gait for it. And we all know this. You know, if you're, if you're counting, let's say you're counting your three-beat canter, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. and you go, oh, my God, he's, he's falling out of canter. You know, I'm losing the canter. And you, you give him a bit of a squeeze on or you wrap your legs around him and give him a squeeze. Your horse has just gone out of self-carriage, right? So if you have to hold your legs there squeezing the horse, you've lost self-carriage. So you want to get the horse back into self-carriage and then release that pressure again. So any time that you feel that you're holding your horse in a gait, you're not in self-carriage. So the way to get over that is to get the horse back into the gait you wanted and release that cue that you were holding on to. And more often than not, that's a leg cue. Although, you know, we sometimes forget that voice cues are also pressure. So if you cluck to your horse, and you see this a lot with um, riding school horses or kids' ponies and things, and you, you'll get the pony into trot and go, and you find you have to do that for, you know, 30 minutes the whole time when you're trotting, and, and it's exhausting for you and probably quite annoying for the pony as well. So don't forget that your voice is also a pressure cue. So your voice needs to stop when the pony responds with the right movement. So if you're asking for trot and the pony is trotting and you can feel that two beat movement, don't cluck. Wait till the pony makes a mistake and and starts um, walking, which is probably going to do, it's probably not going to start cantering. Just got a little spider dropping down to say hello. Um, so yeah, wait till it makes a mistake and then correct that mistake. Put it back into the pace you wanted, put it back into trot and then release again. What the horse needs to know is that you are going to release. What the horse needs to know is that self-carriage exists and that it can do this and you will, it will be left alone if it does. So rhythm is our first thing, the beat. The second one is tempo. So tempo, excuse me, is how fast. Now the walk, an average walk is about just over six kilometers an hour. So it's not a hugely fast pace. The trot is between 13 and 19 kilometers an hour. Now I've got all the Americans are listening to me this morning. So sorry, guys, do your own conversions. <laughs> um, the canter is sort of 19 to 24 kilometers an hour. It's the horse's responsibility to maintain the speed or tempo that you have set. So let's say you're in the trot and you want to go 15 kilometers an hour. And so you're going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And that's that's what you're rising to, one, two, one, two, one, two. Good, steady working trot. The horse has to maintain that without you having to force that. So without you having to have your legs on the horse all the time or having to correct it. And this is where the counting the strides really comes in. Um, and so Libby's just asked a question, is tracking up a natural ability or trained response or both? Okay, I will get to that. Thanks, Libby. Um, so with that, um, just coming back to that, that tempo, the, it's the horse's responsibility to maintain the tempo. So the counting really helps you because if you're going one, two, 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 you know when the horse slows down. It's one of the ways that is really obvious for you to be able to tell when the horse slows down. And so then you speed the horse up, then you reapply the cue. As soon as you get your tempo back again, you can release that cue. Um, now tracking up, yes, Libby, is of course a natural ability. Yeah, horses do track up naturally. Um, it is also a trained response. So, you know, if your horse is, and we're getting to um, stride length next, actually, but, um, and that we'll discuss it again with stride length, but 
Tempo will also help you here. So the speed of the gait will also help you. If your horse is going very slowly, it's probably stepping quite short as well. I think one thing to keep in mind, though, when we're talking about tempo is that a lot of people think, mostly because they're told by their dressage instructors or their just general instructors, that you have to, you know, if you've got a young horse especially, that you have to always have a good working trot, you know, forward, 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 you know, go, go faster, get him going, get him in a good working trot, you know. And I'm disinclined to agree with that, I'm afraid, because I think that what's really important, first of all, is relaxation. Secondly, is self-carriage. Thirdly, is making it pretty. So you get the feet to move, get the feet to move consistently, then you take them where you want them to go, then you make it pretty. So we've got to start with the horse relaxed. We So we get the feet moving and the horse is relaxed. And then, you know, the next thing we want to do is to teach self-carriage. So that the horse maintains that speed, and we'll talk in a minute, Libby, about stride length, maintains that until it's asked to do something else. And that's the next important thing to get. Now, with a young horse, even just an educationally young horse, um, speed is an interesting thing because if you ask your horse to go in a good working trot, it's not going to be able to do that for very long. Be able to jog, still a two beat movement all day. But, you know, a good working trot is quite tiring. Now, if you've got a horse that hasn't had a lot of work, as we discussed last week with the back from the breakers and bucking like a bronco, um, that horse is likely to object. It's also, we've got to remember, that the horse can only think of one thing at a time. Now, if that thing might kill it, i.e. speed, then that is going to be its focus. Your, it, relaxation is going to go out the window, self-carriage is going to go out the window because the horse is going to be focused on speed alone. The reason the horse is going to be focused on speed alone is because it's just the most important thing to the horse because if you make him go in a good working trot for, you know, an hour when, and the horse doesn't know that you're not going to do that, then it will die. So it's very important for the horse's survival that it thinks about those things. So it will be the horse's focus. And that's why I always say, don't worry too much about your training gait. If it's a slow trot, as long as your beat is correct, and as long as the horse is relaxed and in self-carriage, especially with the trot, we can make it pretty later. We've seen the horse in the field. We know that horse has a stunning extended trot. You know, we've seen it in the field doing this. We're like, oh, my God, I want to ride that. We can, we can get that. We can make the trot pretty later. We can always, always improve the trot. The only time I'd worry about it is in the canter. So if your horse is going to, into a four-beat canter because you never, never want to practice a pace or a gait that you don't want the horse to repeat. So if you allow your horse to go in a four-beat canter, then you're practicing that and that will be something the horse is likely to repeat later. So you don't want that to happen. You always want to keep enough momentum going in the canter so you have a true three-beat canter. Um, so there we are. That's, that's it really with tempo. The horse, it's a horse's responsibility to maintain the speed of the gait. And again, you know, you come back to that riding school horse that needs to be pushed all the time. And you, you say, oh, it's awful. It's an awful thing to have to ride. And it must be for the horse an awful thing to have to do as well. I mean, it just can't be a pleasant experience to have somebody constantly sort of kicking you or nudging at you. The next thing is stride length. And and this is something, again, that, you know, it's it's quite easy to measure. It sounds quite complicated. And we always think, oh, you know, I've got it. I've got it. If I'm moving up, you know, let's say from prelim to novice dressage and suddenly you have to lengthen the horse's stride. You think, oh, you know, it's a bit, I don't really know how to do that. Well, I always find one of the best ways of doing it is to, if you've got an arena and you've got markers in the arena, the thing to do is to count your horse's strides between the markers and then ask the horse for longer strides and count them between those same markers. And then you can see actually when the horse is lengthening its stride. And I find that's the easiest way of working that out. But again, when it comes to self-carriage, the horse should maintain that length of stride until 
you ask it to do something else. So it's like PF. When I teach PF, um, because PF is just a trot. You know, a lot of people say to me, oh, it's so pretty. Can you teach my horse to PF? And my answer is, well, I don't know. Can your horse trot? I say, yeah. I say, okay, well, then certainly we can teach it to PF because all we're doing PF is we're slowing it down. So we're changing the tempo and we're changing the stride length. So we're, it's still a trot, but we're making the step shorter. And we're making it a bit slower. So for me to teach PF, I don't tie the horse still and then faff around with the whip on its legs at all because what I find with that is that you usually lose the trot, you lose the two-beat movement, usually in the hind legs the because the hind legs get really yucky about being tapped with the whip all the time because it's horrible. Um, so what I do is I use the long side of the arena and I first teach the horse the pattern, you know, let's teach the horse the pattern first. And so my pattern is when you get to the long, and I'm leading, of course, I'm leading the horse on the left side and we're going down the long side of the arena on the horse's left side. So his right side's next to the fence. Um, and when you get to the fence, it's trot. So I trot backwards. It, you know, I always te seem to teach this in the middle of summer for some reason. The first time I taught it was at John and Josh Lyons in the middle of summer in Colorado. It was so hot. Um, but fantastic. It's a fantastic thing to teach. It's really good. So you, you basically you, you lead the horse, you run backwards with the horse, and you just tap on the hip just to get trot. Okay. You run backwards, you trot, and then you get the horse to come out away, trotting, still trotting as it comes off the side, off the rail, and then ask it to walk when it's off the rail. So the pattern really has to be when you hit the rail, you trot, you trot until you come off the rail and then ask to walk. You have to be asked to walk and that's really important. That's where the self-carriage comes in because what the horse is doing, the horse is learning self-carriage in trot. The pattern is trot all the way down the long side. Okay, or as far as you can run backwards, which sometimes isn't very far, depending on the heat. Um, so then what you start to do is you start to shorten the stride a bit. And so obviously your horse already knows give to the bit, softness in the bridle, so that's great. Um, and you also will have taught things like hips to the fence and that sort of thing and shoulder control. So your horse knows that that inside rein there is left rein controls the shoulder and you're standing there close to the horse's head so you're blocking its movement quite effectively and then you just do the same thing so you shorten the stride and slow the pace a little bit each time you come off but you do the same thing you make sure you're trotting as you hit the rail you go down as you go down the long side against the rail you shorten the stride you slow it down a little bit and you get the horse to come off a bit faster in trot and don't ask it to walk till you're off so make sure it's really really important that you don't get the horse to walk before you come off the rail the reason is because that ruins our self-carriage pattern yeah we want the horse to be thinking trot for this whole lesson this lesson's all about trot it's got nothing to do with walk and so you want that self-carriage you want that trotting self-carriage and then you all the only thing you have to adjust then is the speed and the um and the rhythm yeah and so it's a really good way of teaching pf it's a lot of fun to do that as well um and you get a really good clean pf out of that so if you want to learn a little bit more about that that might be quite a fun thing to to make a training video about inside the training I might do that soon. All right. Um, the next one is line. So basically this is straightness. Now I had a conversation with someone the other day about straightness. You excuse me if I, I've got some really good coffee this morning from in town at Bundaberg, which I just need to a bit dry in the mouth here. Um, so line, the horse should maintain its line, um, which is part of the self-carriage equation. So, you know, somebody was saying to me the other day that they can't get their horse to go straight. And straight is really hard, especially for a horse, because straight makes no sense to the horse at all. Horses, you watch them in the field, they never walk straight. No, they amble over here and over there and they're looking for grass and they're doing something else. What, what is straight means nothing to them. So what I do to get the horse to go straight is I actually do turns. And so... 
I start off when you're doing your give to the bit work for a start, we start off doing serpentine. So um, bend the horse right, get it to follow its nose round to the right, and then pick up the left rein gently and get the horse to turn left, bend left, follow its nose around to the left. And so I do sort of half circles like this. And so um, each time I come around, I change direction and the horse's head, what I want to do is, you know, of course, maintain that um, softness in the bridle and the frame and the horse just moves its head from one side to the other. What happens to start with quite often when you go from the left rein to the right rein, for example, is the horse starts here and then he throws his head up and you turn and it puts its head back down again and then next time it might be a little bit less and the next time it'll be a little bit less and before you know it the horse just changes direction like this because it learns the pattern and the pattern is that you know this, you don't have to do this the pattern is you're just going to change direction you're going to end up and so he, he skips doing that because that's unnecessary for the horse to put his head up in between and he just does that so back to line the horse should maintain, let's say here is going around to the right, should maintain that right hand side of the serpentine or circle until I pick up that left rein and ask him to turn left. Now with the going straight, because that's so much harder for the horse, because then you're on two reins, not one. And the reason I don't start with straight is because if you pick up pressure on two reins, the horse has the ability to then brace against you with its whole sort of skeletal system. And horses like x race horses or, you know, schoolmaster dressage horses that have been going around and are used to bracing against rain pressure will, will do that. Whereas if you teach give to the bit first from one side and then the other side, what you're doing is you're offsetting the head just slightly. And what that means is that you're only really working the head and neck muscles just for a bit and not and the horse can't brace against that so you're not um ever putting yourself in a position where you've got both reins and the horse could just stick his head up and brace against your um rein pressure as by offsetting it you're just working this this head and neck bit rather than the whole horse which is so much more powerful so it just makes it easier for you to get it across to the horse and if whatever makes it easier for you to get across the horse of course makes it much easier for the horse to learn so that's why we do it so what we don't want to do if we want a horse to go straight maintain its line what we don't want to do is first of all pick up both reins and say right we're going straight yeah because what's going to happen is that every time the horse steps right or steps left you're going to have to correct that really quickly and so again we're back to the opposite of self-carriage. So how do I do it? Well, I teach the serpentines, yep. And what I do is I make the change of direction longer. So I'll go right, straight, left, straight, right, straight, left, straight. And then I'll make that longer. So left, straight right straight left straight and what you find in those straight bits in between is that you're actually then riding on two reins the horse is keeping its head nice and soft it's maintaining the softness in the bridle and it's not pulling against you it's not raising its head it's not changing anything and so eventually we go like this then the horse then just can go can go straight still soft in the bridle and i found that's the easiest way for the horse to learn straightness so the easiest way for for me to teach straightness so i actually teach straightness from a circle and i just offer the horse the opportunity to stay straight so then if the horse let's say for example i was talking to somebody on the phone about this the other day um and they said that they were trying to get their horse to go straight and what was happening was horses was bulging out in I can't remember which shoulder, but let's say it was bulging out on the right shoulder. So it was falling or drifting to the right. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. What's happening is that it's actually, it's turning right and you wanted to go straight. So go back to the serpentine. So every time you feel that shoulder go right, turn it to the left. And the horse will get that pattern, go back to your serpentines, turn right, turn left. And if the horse falls in to one side, pick up the other end and turn that way. And what the horse then learns is, oh, okay, so when I drop this shoulder, 
actually then I have to pick it up again and I have to go that way. So I'm not going to do that anymore. I'll just stay here and I'll wait until Kate asks me to change direction. And that's self-carriage. That's your horse learning self-carriage. It's exactly what we want the horse to think. You know, I'll just stay here. I'll do this going in this direction until I'm asked to go in another direction. And the final thing, which is the thing we always think about first, for me, the final thing is outline. So that's the horse maintaining the same frame and the same head and neck position. Now, a lot of people look at, you know, the horses I ride and I teach give to the bit and they think, oh, I don't need that. You know, I, it's, it's dressage and I don't need that. I'm, you know, a bush rider or I'm a trail rider and, you know, I just don't need it. But it's not about that it's about safety so it's about getting the horse into the engagement zone it's about communicating with the horse it's about building that bubble of communication where you and the horse are safe and you can take that bubble onto the trail or into the arena or out to your friend's house or into the paddock wherever you are you can travel safely with your horse in that bubble and that is what it's all about the fact that you also get frame posture head and neck position that is is a bonus but what I've found is it's the easiest way to get the horse into the engagement zone it's the easiest way to get the horse relaxed and engaged with learning um, and so therefore it's the easiest way to move the horse's feet where I want them to go um, and so that's why I put outline last is because it really for me it's the it's the bit that makes it pretty I start with it it's already there. So I put it last because if you're talking about self-carriage is, you know, really the least important thing because we've got to think because the horse already has, you know, if you're doing the can-do training, he's already got self-carriage. I mean, he's already got the frame. He's already got the outline, the softness in the bridle, the head and neck position. You've got that anyway. So really, if you're worrying about your self-carriage is you've got to be concentrating on these other five things. So that's the rhythm, the tempo, the stride length, the line, your straightness, and the outline. So those, all those five things go together to make up self-carriage. Now, I said right at the beginning that, you know, it's not, it's not just about dressage horses, you know. So where else do we see self-carriage? I just want to give you a few examples of, of where we see it. Um, as I said before, I don't think we see it terribly often, sadly, today, um, in the modern dressage arena. Um, and you can see whether, you, whether you're seeing self-carriage or not in the dressage arena. Look at the, the rider's hands or contact. Now, if that rider has an unrelenting contact on the bit, then the horse is not in self-carriage. The reason the horse isn't in self-carriage is because it's being held in frame. So you've lost that outline bit. So the horse isn't maintaining its own outline. And, you know, in the lower levels of the dressage competitions, a novice, and maybe even some of the prelim ones, you give and take the reins. And, you know, give and take the reins for such a short time, you know, um, it's, it's hardly a test. I mean, it's good that they're doing that. But, you know, let's test ourselves a bit more. It's a good way to see whether your horse is in self-carriage. You know, can you move your hands six inches forward and have the horse maintain everything? If so, great, because then you have got self-carriage. And you do that with most of those top level dressage horses at the moment and then probably leave the arena. You know, they don't actually maintain themselves, but you can see that from the contact that they have that unrelenting contact. And, you know, it's, a, it's one of the basic principles of ethical training is you can't have unrelenting pressure. And so any sort of constant contact is an unrelenting pressure. So that's the horse not maintaining outline. And the next thing you can see with those dressage horses is that they don't um, maintain tempo because they're constantly being spurred at. You know, legs are constantly on the horse. You know, you're always being told as a dressage rider to pick him up, wrap your legs around him, hug him with your legs. Again, it's unrelenting pressure. The horse is not in self-carriage because the horse is being always moved forward by the rider. What happens when those riders take their legs off the horse is the horse just falls apart. 
which is not what you want. You want the horse to continue in self-carriage until it's asked to do something else, to continue what it's been asked to do until you change the request. So when can you see a horse in self-carriage that you probably wouldn't have thought of before? Um, now, I'd say the horse on the trail. The horse on a trail ride, been ridden on the buckle, that's just maintaining that, let's say you're going through a big paddock and it's just maintaining the line, maintaining the speed, maintaining the posture. Perhaps it's got a low head. It can even have a low head. Might be walking, might be jogging in a straight line, heading in that direction. You've set it on that course and that horse goes there until you change the course, until you suddenly decide, oh, perhaps I'll go over there and you change direction or you change speed or you ask it to pick its head up or, or something else. But that horse is basically in self-carriage and it's just being left to go forward like that and you're not having to interfere. It's a beautiful example of self-carriage and that's the horse you want to ride. I mean, that's fun, isn't it? It's fun when your horse will just do what you've asked it to do and maintain that. Um, another one is a horse leading. And if you've ever led a horse and it's constant sort of correction and pulling you and pushing you and pulling forward and stopping when you're going and all of that, that's a horse not in self-carriage when you're leading it. If you've led a horse that just walks next to you nicely, that's a horse in self-carriage at lead. So, you know, it's, it's a thing you wouldn't probably think of when you think of self-carriage, but it is definitely um, a question of self-carriage. And it's important that we get our horses into self-carriage in all of these situations. And I think on the lead, it's especially important because there's nothing worse than going to get your horse from the paddock, for example, and trying to bring it in, having an argument with it before you even get there because you can't get through the gate or you're pulling it or it's pulling you, whatever it is, you know. The horse just walks along nicely next to you. It's, it's really pleasurable. Another one I always think of when I think of self-carriage is trailer loading. And the horse that you get to the bottom of the ramp, you throw the rope over the horse's back and the horse walks onto the trailer, that's self-carriage. You know? And that's another really, really important example of self-carriage that is often overlooked. You know, the horse that we have to um, teach to get on, you know, not teach to get on, but the horse that we have to tap to get on um, every time or pull on or any of those other, I mean, trailer loading can be a nightmare. But all of those are examples of a horse not in self-carriage. Real self-carriage with the trailer is the horse sees the trailer, you throw the rope over it, the horse walks straight up and stands on. That's the horse maintaining the rhythm, the tempo, the um, stride, the line and the outline. Yeah, he's relaxed, he's walking on, his head's down, it's all good. Um, and I th always think that's a beautiful example of self-carriage. So that is it from me uh, for today, unless you have any other questions. I think that self-carriage is a hugely important thing um, and it comes, you know, straight after relaxation, getting your horse into the engagement zone. As soon as you start teaching, give to the bit, you are starting to teach self-carriage. And it should become all of these things become automatic responses. You know, it's like give to the bit becomes an automatic response. So as soon as I pick up the rein when I'm on a horse, it softens in the bridle, it's in frame, and then off we go. And the horse is in self-carriage. That is, that is an automatic response. That's what it becomes because it becomes such a habit for the horse to do that. It's completely automatic. Anyway, I'm going to leave you there and I will see you next week. Um, I'll see you this week, of course, on Facebook Live if you can join me. Join me, And uh, we'll be talking about self-carriage. So if you do think of some questions afterwards, just email them to me and I will discuss them um, during the week. Otherwise, I will see you next week probably from the same place. I like it here. <laughs> Bye.